<laughs> All right. So uh, the uh, our speaker this week is Dr. Gangji Lee, who is an assistant professor in the physics department here at uh, Georgia Tech. And her research uh, mainly focuses on studying the formation of exoplanets, in particular hot Jupiters. And uh, she's going to be talking about some of that work uh, today. And, and of course, this work is uh, really important for understanding the habitability potential for uh, these exoplanets. She uh, got a bachelor's degree in astrophysics from Caltech and a PhD in astrophysics from Harvard. And then uh, went on to staying at Harvard for a postdoc before you uh, came here. Yes, and I met her uh, right when I was interviewing, uh, <laughs> right when she just started here. And so I'm really excited for uh, Dr. Lee to uh, talk to us today, especially since I spent most of yesterday talking with exoplanet researchers. So I'm primed to talk about exoplanets. So um, good yeah, thank you for uh, giving a talk. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and for having me here. It's my great pleasure to be here and to talk about exoplanet formation and habitability. Uh, so it's true that I work on uh, hot Jupiters a lot, but for this talk, it's more tuned on habitability. So we're going to look at the smaller ones that are closer to our own Earth. So I hope you'll be interested. Uh, so first of all, um, uh, in this talk, we're going to particularly focusing on spin dynamics, how the planets rotate. Um, and uh, first, we're going to look at obliquity or how the planet's rotational axis is tilted from their orbit. So we know uh, from our own Earth, we are very lucky we have um, uh, obliquity that is very stable around 23 degrees. So as the Earth orbiting around the sun, we can feel on the north hemisphere, we can feel summer, uh, winter, and it goes all around. We can experience these nice four seasons. Uh, however, this is not always true. Um, and even for the Earth, it has very small two or three degree modulations, and that can give us Milankovitch cycles, and which can induce the glacier cycles. But overall, it's very nice and regular. Um, but even for our close neighbor, Mars, um, the obliquity variation can be wild, drastic, as our expert on Mars, James, sitting here. <laughs> yes, you can see it can have large variations from zero to 60 degrees, um, very chaotically varying. And this can have drastic effects on Mars, in particular when Mars is at high obliquity, um, the equator will become colder. So this can cause precipitation, or snow of the atmosphere falls down and produce these glacier-like features. And this dynamical analysis on the spin variations also have support from geological evidences, where today we can see that in the mid-latitude of Mars, there are glacier-like features, glacier-like landforms, which is not compatible with the low obliquity of Mars today, where this region will be warm and hot today. Okay, so now uh, the standing question is uh, to understand this climate variations and for these planets, I uh, want to understand why the Earth and Mars are very different. So in terms of the orbital and spin uh, properties of Earth and Mars, they're actually quite similar. So why does Earth have a stable obliquity, but Mars has very wildly changing orbit? Okay, so to answer that, we can take a step back and look at how the obliquity vary. So there are uh, two particularly important processes governing the spin variations. So first of all, uh, as the planet is rotating, spinning around, it's flattened like a piece of dough. So the equator is uh, reached out and this gives us the quadruple moment. And then the sun, the star, will talk this quadruple moment and allow the planet spin axis to precess uh, like this, precess around the orbital orientation. So you can see with this process along, uh, this obliquity angle is a constant. It doesn't change obliquity drastically. So now we can introduce the other uh, ingredient. Um, so from this, we can calculate this precession rate depending on the mass of the star, the separation, and the rotation rate and quadruple moment of the planet. Um, and then we can realize uh, that for our own solar system, the Earth is not a single child. It has many companions around it, and the companions can perturb each other's orbit and make the orbit oscillates like this. So in the uh, multi-compact planetary system, typically the inclination and eccentricity are low, and this variation are quite uh, regular, and then we can decompose it to a large number of uh, normal modes, uh, like springs or oscillating pendulums. We can find these oscillation modes, and these are 
quasi periodic oscillations. And then we can put these two together. We can see uh, we have a top planet that is precessing, and its orbit is also oscillating. Put this together is analogous to a precessing top and oscillating plane. And we have two frequencies. One is the precession frequency, and the other is the oscillation modal frequency. So when the two frequencies match, we have a spin orbit resonance, and then the spin orbit resonances can drive large amplitude variations. So this is analogous to like pushing the kids on the swing with the natural frequency, and then the effects can accumulate, and you have large effects variations on the spin axis. Okay, so now we can see the basic mechanism for spin variations. Let's go back and look at the case of the Earth and Mars. So back then, early in 1993, Das Carr and his collaborators looked at the variation of the Earth um, spin axis. So they first look at the forcing frequencies, the, how the orbit varies. So they take the Fourier transform of the well, obtained oscillation modes of the Earth orbit. And here it is. And we can find the S modes, the dominant modes of the Earth orbit. And then one can calculate the precession frequency due to the star, the sun and uh, from the quadruple moment of Earth and distance from the sun, et cetera, and the precession frequency. And interestingly, we can see from the talk due to the sun, the precession frequency of the Earth actually coincides with the orbital oscillation frequency. So this is telling us that the Earth should have a large orbital variations just like Mars. So what's missing here? Any thoughts? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So when we look at um, our own uh, sun Earth interactions, we will realize when we look at the night sky, we also have another companion very important to our dynamics, and that is our moon. So now adding the moon, the moon is actually, although it's much, much smaller comparing with the sun, but it's so much closer. So the torque is actually larger. Um, due to the moon comparing with that due to the sun. And including the torque from the moon on the Earth's spin axis, it leads to a precession frequency that's too much larger than this uh, dominant modes. So it detunes Earth's ability. It tunes the secular spin of the resonances uh, for the Earth. Okay, so here's some numerical simulations for the case with the moon and then without the moon. So the x-axis is the initial obliquity for the Earth, and the y-axis is the minimum, maximum, and average obliquity over a 10 million year evolution. So you can see when this is all um, closely manually packed, the variation of obliquity, the maximum and the mean, are very close to each other, so there's not much modulation of obliquity. However, only when Earth's obliquity is very large, um, there's a chaotic region. Um, and then for the case without the moon, wow, it's all very chaotic. Uh, including the law of the starting around 20-some degrees, like today, have larger variations from 0 to about 50 degrees. Okay. So this is telling us that we really need to appreciate the existence of the moon without the moon. We don't know when winter will come, when the ability will become high, <laughs> and then our region will become icy, and when spring will come back. So the moon is very important. So here's the story that we answered our puzzle about our own solar system. And now it's also very exciting that we have more than 5,000 exoplanet, uh, exoplanets discovered, confirmed exoplanets discovered. So we want to understand whether there are similar planters, planets like the Earth and that have environment that's favorable for life to occur. And then spin ability is also an important um, question for these planets. So you can see over the years, um, this shows the, the planets that reside in the habitable zone around their host star in the plane of the masses and periods. So you can see, first of all, there are large mass planets discovered because their size is large, influence is big. And later on, there are all smaller planets discovered closer to their host star, and they still remain in the habitable region of the host star. So you can see there are a very large population of them. So a lot of targets for us to do detailed analysis of. Okay. And there are many ingredients important for planetary habitability. So we can see, uh, including like the um, stellar interactions, uh, stellar effects, planetary properties, biology, atmosphere, surface, interior, and orbital dynamics here. 
as well as the planetary systems looking at um, the evolution and then companion planets. So yeah, there's lots to explore, so in a very golden time to study this topic. <laughs> okay. And now uh, in this talk, we'll mainly focus on this paper, looking at the orbital and spin dynamics, which is a part on the, uh, analyzing the habitability of these planets. Okay. So now, uh, looking at these exoplanets, we started with one, um, capital 186F, which is the first validated Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone. We look at start with one particular planetary system to analyze the spin dynamics in more detail. Uh, so what is this system? So this planet um, is orbiting around the lower mass star point five solar mass. And the orbital period is shorter, 130 Earth days. And the whole system is not too far away, about 500 light years away from the Earth. And here is our habitable zone planet, uh, 186F. And then here are the companion planets closer into the whole star. So I'm going to analyze the effect of F. Okay, so we did a similar approach as how the Lascars group worked on our own Earth. So we obtained the Fourier transform of the orbital oscillation for planet capital Y 6 F. And here is the result. So we can see two important dominant modes on the oscillation of the orbit. And then we can assume uh, the planet is Earth-like and calculate what is the precession frequency of the spin. So you can see there's large uncertainties in this number. And then we can assume if this is Earth analog, this is very far away from the dominant mode. So most likely, um, this is having a quite stable um, obliquity without spin of the resonances, which leads to large obliquity variations. OK. Uh, so, and we can also see, including a large moon, um, the precession frequency will only increase, so it's even further away from the dominant modes. So adding a moon is also stable. But now you may wonder, we don't really know very well about the planet. We only know the size. The mass is still has large uncertainties already. So how certain do we have uh, for, for this result? And then we can see that this very different from the solar system, but this planet only has one dominant peak. So it only requires a very high, highly fine-tuned parameters to make this precession frequency to match um, these dominant modes. So we can uh, be confident that the system is very most likely have a stable obliquity. It's a very rare chance to exactly match this oscillation. And then you may wonder, why, why is this planetary system have a allowing the planet, have the boson planet to have a stable obliquity different from the Earth. And the reason all lying in the architecture property of the planetary system. So we can see different from the Earth uh, in the solar system, uh, where the Earth is very closely packed uh, with Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. The four are closely coupled together, and they have strong interactions to each other that introduce S1 to S4 modes that is uh, give the dominant effects on the spin variations too. Uh, however, for 186F, it's really a loop, right? It's quite <laughs> alone, separated with its companions. So the only other planets will act as a whole and give one dominant mode onto this planet F. And that's why the spectrum, the Fourier transform will look very different from the solar system Earth case. So the overall orbital spacing of this planetary system tell us a lot about the small spin variations for the planetary systems. Okay, so we can also see this agrees with the micro simulations. Um, the object here typically doesn't have much interest in uh, if that is a little <laughs> boring straight line, so we're there, agreeing with the analytical estimates. Okay, so now we look at uh, about the spin variations, dynamical effects on the planet. And then we may actually wonder. So now we look at a case for the Mars, we see uh, atmosphere precipitation, snow, and form the glaciers. But overall, how does the spin variation affect the climate? So one very simple, naive uh, way to look at it using the simplest cases uh, include the energy balance model, where we're only looking at one dimensional um, changes of the energy for the Earth. So we include uh, solar radiations, reflection of the solar radiation from clouds and ice, and also thermal emission of the planet. And then we take the balance of this, assume everything is in equilibrium, 
And then we can take a first other estimates on the temp global temperature variation for the planet to see what is the effect of obliquity. Okay, so now let's look at um, the constraints on obliquity due to the spin variations. Okay, so this was actually done very early in 1997, partly inspired by the study of Las Car, who found Earth, Moon as Earth could have large obliquity variations. So they wonder like what would Earth look like if it actually have large obliquity from different from 23 degrees. Um, so they did a simple one-dimensional energy balance model. And then they can calculate the surface temperature as the planet orbit around the whole star with different obliquity. And the different lines uh, shows the different latitude on the top of this planet. So they did the one D is the, um, the one changing dimension is that on the latitude of the planet. So we can see um, different from a low obliquity case. One obliquity is around high, about polar um, 90 degrees obliquity, where the spinning um, axis pull, uh, pull pass, uh, to the whole star. We can see in this case at high latitude, it has a very drastically changing temperature as the planet orbiting around the whole star as we would expect intuitively, right? where the pole is pointing towards the sun, it's really hot, and then when it's pointing away, it's very cold, it has large variations. And at the equator is mostly similar year around, and then at the equator is much colder than at the polar pole areas. Um, and then interesting result here is they found the limiting obliquity, which is around 54 degrees. So this is telling us that changing from low obliquity to high obliquity state wise above 54 degrees, there's a climate zonation uh, reversal. So one obliquity is low, uh, the equator is very hot, and the pole is very cold. However, one obliquity is above 54 degrees, the equator becomes colder than the pole because it has less of direct sunlight, so it's more tangential uh, to the surface. So this is a very interesting number which we will revisit again. Uh, so. And now uh, we can see the study before and we look at a static obliquity, right? So we see um, a lot of interesting effects occurs when obliquity have large variations over time. So we want to understand if we allow the obliquity, the spin axis to vary over time, what would be the effects on the climate? So here uh, is the uh, system that we study to do this investigation. One very simple way to allow the spin axis ability to change uh, is having the change on the inclination because what we care about is the spin orbit misalignment. And making the orbital change, we can put another planet there and then the inner planet orbit will precess around the total angular momentum of the system. And this will allow the inclination of the orbit to change. Um, and this will further induce uh, spin changes. If the spin axis is constant and orbit changes, it will produce some variations in the spin orbit misalignment on the obliquity. Right. Okay, so using this simple picture applying to um, a system with planar companion or with stellar companion, so it might will be a binary star system, we can see the results here. So we make the application to Alpha Centauri, which is a binary star system. And we have a planet orbiting around Alpha Centauri B in a habitable zone. So to minimize the effects of eccentricity, we allow the eccentricity to stay on the force eccentricity. So some detailed dynamical things where the star will uh, force eccentricity at this value. So the eccentricity is not uh, stable around circular orbit, but it's quite stable around this axis. And then we can look at how the objective changes. Uh, and we can see at certain mutual inclination obliquity can have large variations. And now we include this dynamical model with the um, 1D energy balance model allowing the spin axis to vary. And here is the result. So the first row plus eccentricity over time, second row plus obliquity over time, uh, third row plus the surface temperature over time. And then this is our calculated ice mass over time for this planet. So here's the cool part. So if I put a planet at the um, outer region in the cool areas in the habitable, still within the habitable region, um, when the ability have large variations, it can very efficiently induce a snowball phase for the planet. So here's the idea. 
So when the planet oblique is low, around 23 degrees like the Earth, we can see the equator uh, is very warm with no ice. And then the pole will start to have some ice here. And then when oblique increases up further above this 54 degrees, the equator will accumulate ice. And then ice on the pole will very efficiently melt. But now, when we do it, circle it back at the low oblique state, you can see the pool will start to have some ice, but the ice on the equator does not melt. It does not melt efficiently because it has a very large thermal inertia at the equator because the area is much larger. So this way, as the pool starts to accumulate ice and the equator, small ice does not melt efficient enough, the whole planet will very quickly convert it into a snowball. <laughs> okay, so, so so far we look at some uh, variations on the ability changes of the planet uh, relative to the spin uh, on the spin dynamics of planet, but we can also see there's another very interesting effects on the spin very uh, rotation of the planet. That is, it's also um, uh, governs our day night cycles. Right, one is rotates, one face facing from to the sun, the other is facing away from the sun, the night nice side, and as it rotates, it has a thin night cycles. And this is also very interesting for this exoplanets in the very extreme conditions different from the Earth. <clears throat> One interesting um, part about this exoplanet thin night cycles is many of the exoplanets discovered due to the detection limitations, and the planets are very close to the host star. So it's easier to be found and have short orbital periods, and it's easier to be found from the transit measurements. Um, and then when they are very close to the host star, um, the tidal interactions from the star and the planet become very strong. When the tides become very strong, many of the planets can be tidally locked. So this means the case such as the Earth and the Moon, we will only see one face of the Moon. So the planet will have a permanent day-night um, side. So one side is always um, uh, bright on the day side and the other side is always night side. And there are lots of studies looking at the case when the planet is tidally locked, whether the planet is still habitable. Um, so the convention is earlier on, people think in that case, the planet are not very habitable. But later on, people realize when the orbital period is so fast, it can actually induce Coriolis force and a fictitious force for the planet atmosphere that can very efficiently allow the atmosphere to circulate and allow the planet to become warmer, um, uh, to become more, have a more uh, similar temperature on the planet. So it's not too bad. But now, okay. after, after this, we actually realize for these planets in the compact <laughs> systems, it's not always the case that they are tidally locked. Um, the reason is, although the planets are very close to the whole star and the tidal effects is strong, but we can see the planets are also very closely packed with the companion planets. So the planet planet interaction is also very strong. So the planets can kick each other and kick <laughs> each other swing out of the tidally locked stage. So here's the idea. So we can look at um, how the elongated, so the planets will be elongated due to the tidal forcing from the star. And when it's tidally locked, we have a permanent day side and permanent night side. And we're basically looking at how this misalignment and side angle varies over time. Okay, <clears throat> so to investigate this, uh, we uh, developed a rigid body integrator. So back then, most of the uh, integrators calculating the evolution of planets um, are from unbody simulations, assuming the planets have point masses. But here we need to include the spin variations for the planets in combat system. So we develop a new symplectic integrator, um, treating the planets as rigid bodies from the first principles. So this allows us to look at both the orbital variation, the planets moving linear motion, together with the rotational motion of the planets. It's a, a lot like the, doing the classical mechanics classes here. Okay, uh, so putting this, um, starting from the basic uh, first principle on the rigid body integrators, uh, we start from the Hamiltonian of the system and then split it um, this way with the Euler condition with the rigid body component and the compact um, component, component and interaction component. So this is what people done uh, back then, looking at this type of studies. Uh, however, this have a limitation. 
were from this symplectic integrator are in the past. Um, one assumed the orbit is Kaplerian, but this works very well for our own solar system, but this may not work very well for compact systems where the planet-planet interaction is very strong. Uh, so it did a different type of splitting without splitting it uh, due to the Kaplerian motion. So we got the linear kinetic part uh, and the potential energy for the point mass case and then splitting it uh, with the rotational and potential due to spin coupling on the spin part uh, for the second to Hamiltonian. And then we can stick them together and allow the system to integrate not too slowly. <laughs> and here is the result of uh, uh, a rigid body integrator. And here is the case for the earth obliquity over time. And we can see the rigid body integrator agrees very well with the secular uh, results that we discussed earlier uh, for the moonless Earth. And then we also included ties because ties is very strong for this planet, common planetary systems. We can also see this very, agrees very well with the secular integrations too. Okay, so the code works. <laughs> okay, and it also has wide applications, uh, including stellar spin variations, um, tidal migration planets, binary stars, and asteroids. So, if any of you need some rigid body like calculations, just uh, find us. Okay. <laughs> okay. So now let's um, go back to our Trappist one system. Uh, so applying this uh, rigid body integrator that we developed, we look at spin variation of the hyper boson planets in Trappist one, and here's the result. So Trappist one have three or four hyper boson planets, depending on how you um, constrain the uh, region uh, for habitability. Uh, so it starts from um, D, E, F, L, the three ones that are in the optimal habitable region. Um, D is too close in, so the planet planet interaction are not strong enough to kick it out of the uh, tidal locking, but will be the case for E and F. So you can see that through this planet planet interactions, F can have very wide uh, variations on this side angle from 0 to 180 degrees. So sometimes it's tidally locked up here, and sometimes it has drastic variations. And sometimes it's tidally locked on the other end, and sometimes it's drastic again. So it's very sporadic variations on the uh, spin axis, on the rotation. And then for E, it's closer in, and then it's only have modulate variations on the spin. Okay, so now our question go back to how this actually affects the climate similar to the ability variations. So now I find a collaborator, so I did more <laughs> better analysis on the climate variation. I guess Travis One is more popular <laughs> than the other than the other planets. So I found collaborators <laughs> working on atmospheres. Um, so Howard Chen, so he's now a professor at Florida Institute of Technology, um, close to us. So we did a 3D global climate model uh, using exoplasm, so that we simulate Earth-like uh, planet. For Chavist 1E e and Chavist 1F. And here's the result. Okay. Uh, so the um, green line here shows the results for E um, in the perturbed case, allowing the spin axis to vary. And then the dashed um, dark blue line here shows the case of E, assuming it's tidally locked. So here we did the uh, uh, cheating somewhat where we allow E to actually have a spin variations up to 180 degrees. So we actually muted tidal interactions just to see when we assume the spin variations can be wild, what would be the maximum effects on the climate? Okay, but we can still see even when we assume the spin has very wild effects, the effects on the global ice-free area, that's the quantity that we use to characterize the habitability of the planet for now. Um, even assuming it has large variations on the spin, the ice free area is not very different between the tidally locked case and the drastic changing spin case. However, uh, for planet F, which is farther away from the whole star, <coughs> um, the blue line here shows the case where the planet spin axis have wide variations. And then the dash line, which um, Cycles around here shows the case when the planet is tidally locked. So actually, fine with a very wild changing spin axis, planet F become uh, less habitable comparing to the case when it's tidally locked. So why is this? Why is it the case? Yeah. 
And then we realize actually the story is very similar uh, to the story of ability variations. Uh, so this is because when planet F have chaotic spin variations, um, the night side will uh, accumulate ice. However, when the night side goes to back to the day side, the ice does not have enough time to melt. The thermal inertia is too large uh, for, the, for this planet because it's farther away from the whole star. The stellar insulation is uh, weaker. It's, it's a lot colder than the region of planet E. So with this wild variation of the rotation, the planet, um, planet F will more likely to become a snowball. Then the case one is tidally locked, where it's always have a region that is hot and atmospheric circulation from, from these 3D models can bring the heat to the coast that is still quite nice. So our conclusion is we can see that for these planets in the outer region of habitable zone, this chaotic variant spin axis is actually make it more difficult um, for environment like Earth and <laughs> more favorable condition for habitability. So it's, they are more prone to change into a snowball. Um, and then I'll include uh, very quickly on the uh, signatures on TTV. So we also look at the effects of spin up the coupling, uh, other observational effects, because one may assume that feel like seemingly um, the spin axis of the planet is a very small, has very small effects because the planet size is small. So it's very difficult to have direct measurements on planet spin axis. So also look at that and we find uh, one very powerful method for planetary system characterization is transit timing variations because we have very precise time estimate uh, for these planetary systems. So we can calculate the time, measure the time when the planet transit in front of the star. And then when it's only a single planet transiting in the planetary system when it's orbit around the star, the period is a constant. So the transit timing interval is a constant. However, when it has companion planets, the period will vary, the planetary orbit will vary. So this will produce modulations uh, in the transit time intervals. And this can produce the transit timing variation for the planetary systems. So we can see all these effects coming from how the orbit vary, and then including, not including spin uh, effects on the planet, the spin also couples with the orbit. And this can also change the orbital variations, and this can lead to signatures in the transit timing variations. And then for Trappist-1 system, this compact system where the planet-planet interaction is very strong, uh, we can see this can go up to the change in transit, in transit time can go up to around one minute, and this can be measured by GWST. So this could be a cool thing to actually constrain planetary spin axis from observation. Okay. <laughs> so, so far we talked about, <laughs> talked about uh, habitability of these planets. So let's go back and look at how the spin can also tell us about the formation of planetary systems. Um, so again, <clears throat> we can see that it's, very challenging to measure the spin axis of the planet. It's already very difficult to measure the spin axis of the whole star, and now people can use like transit method to measure the spin axis of the uh, very um, tilt of the star. But now we actually have a first detection of planetary spin tilt. So this is done by Marta Brown um, using on a direct image from the planetary system. Yeah. So here's the planet orbiting around the whole star. Um, so this is a very young system, around two, 120 million year old, compared to the sun, which is um, 4 billion year old. More than 4 billion year old. And then the star mass is 0.4 solar mass, smaller than the sun, and the planet mass is uh, 12 to 27 Jupiter masses. So some people may consider it a brown door, but it's, uh, it's cool to be a planet. It's a um, planet ma mass companion. And the distance between the planet and the whole star is 50. AU, uh, 50 Earth Sun distances. So you can see because the planetary system is very young, so the planet is still emitting lots of the, um, um, the uh, thermal emission from the gravitational collapse of this um, planet from the gravitational energy. And so one can actually measure the uh, light emitting from the planet directly and to measure the rotational property of the planet. So they use this. Um, high resolution spectra to measure the planetary rotation. 
And then they also use the astrometric measurements uh, for the planetary motion around the whole star. So from these two, they can constrain the spin orbital misalignment for this planet. So here is the result. So the blue curve shows the distribution of the true companion obliquity, the spin orbital misalignment of the planetary mass companion. And then the black line shows the isotropic distribution. So we can see that overall it can suggest a signature that the companion favors misalignment. And we can see this is actually have a quite large uncertainties, but still it's a great improvement, great advance in understanding of planetary spin axis. Okay. And then putting this information back to the planetary system, we actually see some interesting puzzle on the formation of this planetary system. So here is the whole <laughs> star. The uh, red axis shows the stellar spin axis. And then the black line shows the orbital angular momentum direction. And then this orange line shows the uh, spin of the planet. So you can see this for this system. Um, the star spin axis is very quite well aligned with the orbit. Um, but on the planetary spin axis, it's quite misaligned with the orbit. So now the question is what caused uh, the misalignment in the planetary spin axis? So one may naively think from the planetary formation, the whole system will form from a giant molecular cloud, which will collapse and then form a disk because it has a preferred direction of rotation. As it collapses, it conserves angular momentum uh, rotating around a uh, preferred direction. So the stellar spin and orbital spin of the planet as well as the planetary spin are typically all very well aligned. <clears throat> and then now, most likely, um, the spin orbit misalignment can be introduced when the orbit which carries the largest arm is easier to tilt when the orbit has large variations. And when the orbit has large variations, the stellar spin and the planetary spin will both have large misalignment with the orbital angular momentum. So it is puzzling uh, why the plan this planet has large misalignment, but the star has only a small misalignment. Okay. Um, so when in the discovery paper, people already discussed the possibility of spin of the resonance. Uh, however, the result is negative. This is because the planet is so far away from whole star at 50 AU, so the precession rate is very small. So it's very quite unlikely to have spin of the resonances. Um, and then we're trying to figure out what could lead to the spin tilt of the planet. And now we find, um, actually we have more information about the planetary system that can also give us insights on what caused the formation, caused the tilt of the planetary axis. And then it's from the orbital eccentricity so the orbital eccentricity tells like, the shape of the orbit. When eccentricity is high, it's more elongated, it's more radial orbit. And when planetary system form is typically formed with circular orbits as a planet interacts with the protoplanetary disk. However, this planet it has a very high eccentricity, um, around 0.9. So the question is whether the planet can have the spin axis tilt, but at the same time also have an elongated eccentric orbit. Okay. So now we can flip back and look at what are the mechanisms to produce this eccentric orbit, which can also possibly produce the spin of the misalignment. And one of the powerful <laughs> mechanisms uh, during the formation of planetary system is planet-planet scattering. So the idea goes like this. So as the planetary system forms inside a giant molecular cloud, it forms a disk, and then planet will migrate in the disk. They won't stay just there. They will interact with the disk and move around. And then the final outcome is the planet most likely will form in a, a very compact configuration as they move out closer to the whole star. And then in this case, they have strong interactions. They feel each other strongly. However, when the disk is still around, the gas will calm them down so they don't have very wide interactions with each other. And however, as the whole system ages, uh, the whole star will have solar winds, and then that will photo evaporate on the protoplanetary disk. So when the disk disappears, the planet feels each other very strongly and there's no mechanism to damn the eccentricity. So they become wild and have planet planet scattering. And then over years, people can find the planet planet scattering is very powerful. It produces hot Jupiters, warm Jupiters, and also this wild orbit, very wide orbit exoplanet as it scatters planets everywhere um, in, the, in the planetary <laughs> system. Okay, so now the question is whether the planet spin axis can also tilt 
during this um, planet planet scattering, which is very common uh, in planetary formation. So here is our results using the grid uh, and rigid body simulator. Uh, simulator. So we have three planets that start with low eccentricity orbit that are very close to each other. And we let them uh, interact with each other in both. And the color shows the spin inclination of the planet. So you can see they kick each other around and the eccentricity can sometimes go high and oscillates. So you can see in this type of uh, interactions, the lower mass planets is really we get kicked around quite a lot. And this is through angular momentum deficit equipartition, where um, all the um, <laughs> where the lower mass planets will receive more of a kick. <laughs> you can see one of the low planets got injected. <laughs> 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 Okay. <laughs> okay, so in the end, we actually have um, um, quite eccentric planet with um, Mr. Lamb spin axis for the planet. And then we may also wonder, so what actually caused the spin axis to tilt during the interactions? So as we mentioned earlier, the orbit will tilt more easily compared to the spin. So it's not, uh, the spin is not directly changed from the um, very fast impact during the close encounter. They're not colliding to each other. So we looked at the interaction, close interactions in detail, and we found it's actually still through secular spin of the resonances. So during the close encounter, we can see the um, precession rate, spin precession rate, and all the precession rate can become similar to each other. And this is the region where the ability steadily increase here. So this still tells us that it's the secular spin of the resonances during the close encounter that enhance um, the planetary obliquity. Okay. So this also tells us this uh, origin of this wet orbit planet is very likely um, from, from this interaction close encounter of this planet um, the companions. Okay, so I think I'm almost there. Okay, uh, and the last slide, so we actually uh, so this is for one particular system. So we also wonder how often is it to have cyclic spin of the resonances during planet-planet scattering? And the answer is it actually come very often. So here's the um, scattered plot of the results of planet-planet scattering. The red is the case when there's no resonance crossing. Blue is the case when there are resonance crossing. So you can see about half of the systems actually encounter spin of the resonances. So we would expect to see many of the planets have their spin axis tilted uh, in exoplanetary systems when they have these close encounters and these dynamically hot systems. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our um, seminar today. So we look at the uh, spin of the misalignment. Um, of the planetary systems, and we look at the planet obliquity can influence the snowball transition of the planet, in particular when the planet obliquity cross over the 54 degree limitation when the zonation changes. And then you can see this can also um, be produced and the planet spin, uh, obliquity can be enhanced during the scattering of the planetary system, which can be quite common in planetary formation system, uh, scenarios. So I hope you enjoyed our talk today. Thank you.